Yeah, so uh, APU stands for Asia Pacific University. I am in the far western part of Japan in a very rural area, so it's not the Japan most people think of if you're not in Japan. Um, and I'm going to talk about rethinking textbooks. So I've been obsessed with this for, oh gosh, like six or seven years now. And how can we re-engineer how we do textbooks, kind of democratize the process of textbooks and actually improve them and optimize them. And the main question is, we need to ask ourselves, um, are textbooks optimal? Not, not so much are they good or bad, but are they optimal? Like, are they the best that they could be? And how we can maybe harness new technologies and make it so anybody can make a textbook. Um, and actually what we'll see today, it's you can do it in 10 simple steps. So first, you know, this is an example of the publishing industry and it is a huge endeavor to make a textbook. Uh, so the printing industry, because of this huge endeavor, you need a lot of equipment, things like this. It has limited how, who and how we make books and Things have changed over the last 15 years, but we're still slowly adjusting to modern times. And so we're gonna look at the new technologies, particularly how easy it is to make a book and how books can be a lot different than their current form. All right, so how to make an interactive book in 10 simple steps. So first, let's do a brief history of publishing and how we got here. So, you know, surprisingly, We've only been reading for about 200 years. Um, there's been books for longer than that. Of course, the printing press hundreds of years ago made uh, print, you know, printed material more accessible. But on a grand scale, we've only been reading really for about 100 years. And so the education system was set up um, to, to provide basic literature or reading skills to the masses. And to do that, we had to create the publishing industry. But in doing so, because of the limits to technology, it really um, affected who makes books and how we make books. So first we have the printing press, and then we start making books, and then we have a bunch of barriers. One barrier, of course, is money. So books were really expensive to make. They took a lot of capital investment. Also, they were hard to transport. So you had to get you know, books from you know, across great areas and then get them to students. You needed a lot of technical skill to make the book. Uh, you needed a lot of effort to promote the book. And then six, you had to have access. You had to have not only a gatekeeper accept you, but then once you had the book, there was even more things that you had to have to access the content. So, uh, for example, you had to pay for the CD or you had to, you know, obviously buy the book, etc. So um, we came up with this. So this has been the standard book for the last 30 or 40 years. But this model is basically outdated. So all the content in the book could be presented in a different way. And by the way, in this presentation, I'm not going to be criticizing the publishing industry or books in general, or the authors in general, but just the medium and how we use the medium and maybe we want to look at it a different way. So here is the new model. And actually, I just got this image right before. Um, so it's a perfect little sketch of, of what the new model would look like. And so here we have like an open textbook that anybody can make. It's very low cost and you can gear it to exactly what the students need. And so let's go and look at how we can do this in just a, a couple of days, really. All right, so first one is you want to plan the content. So um, I recommend using a tool like Trello. So let's say you want to write a book, your students want to write a book, the teachers want to write a book. Um, you don't have to do it, you don't have to have some grand vision of what you're going to create. You can just start collecting your ideas and kind of putting them in order. And then over time, you can create a book based on that. So this is a project that I made to create interactive grammar conversations. And every time I would get a, a new idea for a grammar point, I would just put it in Trello and then I would you know, organize it and then get to it at some point later in time. So Trello is a really good tool if you just want to kind of organize your thoughts, but you can just use a notebook or post-it notes. You don't have to use Trello. So then step two is write or record the content. And this is actually the crux, the main part of my message today is that maybe we should stop writing and we should start talking to create books. 
you know, um, we, like I said, we've only been reading for about 100 years on a mass scale globally. And yet humans have been talking for obviously tens of thousands of years, right? So verbal communication has been around, is the essence of communication. And yet when we create, we think we have to write. But writing actually on the mass level is kind of a new phenomenon in human history. But we've been talking forever. Um, for example, there are 6,000 languages in the world, but less than half of those are actually written. So when you write a book, um, the first thing you might want to do is actually just record it. You could actually just say it. So you could do something like with speech notes. Let's say you're going to do a conversation book and you want to write 100 conversations. Well, I recommend that you don't actually don't write the conversations because when you write them, you're doing a different mental process and the language is going to come out a little bit different. Instead, what you can do is just say the conversations. So here I used speech notes and I would click on the record and each line I would just say, person one said this, person two said that, person three said this, person, uh, person two said that, sorry. So you could just actually narrate it. Similarly, you can use a tool like Audacity, which is free. All of these tools are free, by the way. You could use a tool like Audacity and you can just record a conversation or you can re record an interview. And this is really powerful because you can get about 500 words of text in two minutes. And then once you have that, you've spoken what you're going to say in your book, then you could also um, use that media, the audio to bundle it with other media and you can make it um, multimedia friendly. Okay, so uh, this is an example of one of the books, the, one of the many, many um, chapters I've created. So I started doing these interviews in 2003 and now I've created basically, let's see, 3,000 pages of, actually more than that, it would be 4,000 pages of content. And how I did it is I just interviewed somebody. So here I interviewed Abby Demi. She's Canadian. She's originally from Nigeria. And we were just talking about saving money. And so we have a nice little conversation. It looks really nice, very easy to read, very practical. And then you can turn it into a published material. And Abby Demi, by the way, <clears throat> she has some of the best content on my website, which is called lo.org. You can see it up here in the corner. Um, people, everybody has a really good story and they have something that they could share everybody has that so you could just interview your friends you know you could just have conversations with people and then record it and then take that transcript and then turn it into a book and this might sound like heresy to some but it's actually better than anything a textbook can do I mean, you just can't match genuine spoken language what comes out, how people interact, and it's real. And like I said, you can then um, make multimedia from it if you wish. Okay, so then you've created your book. So now maybe you want to do uh, analysis and assess. You can use a tool like Text Helper. So this is a free tool online. Um, and you can just put in the text and you can get a glossary of the words. You can analyze how difficult it is. So there's a lot of tools out there that will help you even assess the difficulty of your language of the language or like is this appropriate for low level learners is this appropriate for high level learners if i wanted to create a glossary for students for japanese students i could quickly make a glossary and i could do this in seven or eight different languages they have uh, chinese portuguese arabic spanish french russian vietnamese thai and i think they have indonesian so there's all these tools out there that you can use to enhance your book and make it more accessible to other people. Um, okay, so then you have to populate the pages. Now here's kind of a trick one. Actually, you can make a book with a PowerPoint or Google Slides. And actually when I make a book with my students or I'm, I'm helping another teacher make a book, I always recommend they just use PowerPoint or Google Slides because of course you can make a book in something like Google Docs or Microsoft Word, but actually, it's much easier to create a book and see the layout and add visuals and add interactivity, which we're coming to next, if you use just a power uh, a slide creation tool. So this is a standard text. Here's something that I actually wrote. So let's say you wanted to write an article. Here's a simple article that I wrote. 
Um, but here's like another example of something that you can make. For like a lower level, you could add images to the slides and you could actually have interactivity in the slide. So if the student does the activity in Google Slides or if they do the activity in PowerPoint, now they can actually move it on the screen. As you can see, it looks just like a, a textbook page and you can add audio as well. So if it's in Google Sheets, you would want to add the audio as a link um, uh, to the audio maybe in, in Google Drive. But if it's in PowerPoint, actually the audio will play right in PowerPoint, which is it's pretty amazing actually. Okay, and also as you can see, you can plan out the book. You can easily just copy the pages. You can create a teacher's copy. I think that's the next slide. So you can easily recycle the content, create teacher's copies. You can add, remove pages, add pages, etc. Uh, okay, so. Uh, next, you have to create visuals. So going back here, by the way, just real quick, here, these visuals actually are in PowerPoint online. And uh, one thing a lot of people don't know is that PowerPoint actually is free online. So PowerPoint, Microsoft has the equivalent of Google Drive. Any student can create an Outlook email account, and then they can access PowerPoint and Microsoft Word for free, um, as long as it's online in the uh, office system or the Outlook system online. Okay, so you want to create visuals. So then the next thing, let's say you want to have some snazzy pictures. So you can get pretty much all the graphics you need using Canva. Um, and can Canva.com also has a lot of really cool templates that will help you kind of, you know, up your, your design game, so to speak. But here's a simple activity that you can make. Like, let's say you have a bunch of you know, just nouns or you know, a common story. You can then go back to Audacity, narrate the story and, and mention these words in the story, and then maybe the student has to put them in the right order or something like that. But if you need visuals, you can easily find them on Canva and it's free. And another free source is Unsplash. And with Unsplash, you can get um, uh, pictures that you can download uh, royalty free. You don't even have to create an account. Um, you can just download the pictures uh, and they are all professionally done. So they're quite snazzy. So here's one of a shark and I took this one of a shark and I used it in an article that I wrote about sharks and then I added my interactivity here. So this would be an example of maybe one page in a book. And one thing I want to kind of touch on here is when you make books, um, there's a couple of things that the publishers are doing wrong. Um, or the standard textbook is doing wrong. One is there's too much nonsense language, just like meta language, you know, like charts to fill out or um, instructions, where actually the bulk of the language in the textbook should be the transcript or what's written, what the students have to read, and what we call language rich input. So, you know, that's, that's, what's organic, that's what's important about the whole lesson. And so that's what we wanna focus on. I think a lot of the textbooks, they have this, you know, they're designed to control kids in a one hour period, keep them busy. Oh, here's something to keep them busy so the teacher can get through the hour. Um, and also the textbooks traditionally by commercial publishers, they don't have um, a lot of space because it's in a traditional book. So they, they don't put enough content like this. Whereas I think that's what we really need in the future. And as we rethink how to make textbooks, we need to have more uh, content and language rich input, and we need to have less activities within the pages. Now, uh, also, once you have a book, we're going to talk about like publishing it at the last step, but you know, you can do a lot of things with your, with your work or with students work. Um, one, you can create a really amazing website, for example, with blogger. So as you're building your collection, it could just be worksheets at first or, or just, you know, simple units, chapters. But as you're building stuff, you can share it online. And uh, I always show my students and fellow teachers how to use Blogger. Blogger, you can make an amazing website that's very interactive and, of course, it's free. Or, of course, you can just host your book um, on cloud hosting like Drive or something like that. And if we look back at the history of, of you know, publishing, you know, this was one of the big things was having to store books. We had to keep books 
in boxes and warehouses. And there's a lot of, it's, you know, it's, it's hard on the environment. It's expensive. Whereas nowadays, if everybody starts making books, their own books, and we just start with the basic PDF level, we can all store this stuff online. And then at the end, I'm going to present what I think the future is going to be like for publishing, how we could all share what we create. Um, okay, so then this is the big part, add interactivity. So one of the things I like to say is that for, if you're going to make a book now, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, no matter how resource strapped your institution is, you can make anything better than a publisher. And that's not, again, I'm not knocking the publishers or that's not, um, I'm not, it's not hyperbole. But what's happened is because of SaaS, which stands for software as a service, there are so many amazing tools out there that teachers can cobble with their text that they can make amazing interactive content that the publishers can't because of branding reasons. So a big publishing house like Oxford or Cambridge, they really can't have links to a quizzes or a links to a Kahoot or a links to a Google form. They have to have everything within their branding, their branding, within their sphere. So what's happened is for small independent producers with no money, you could actually just harness all these amazing tools and include them within your book. So for example, let's say on my reading on sharks, I could create on, um, on Quizlet uh, a glossary of all the words. And then the students can do the interactive games within Quizlet for, for the reading activity. And by the way, this glossary was created using the ER glossary tool. Um, you can do, for example, maybe a quiz on quizzes based on the reading, or you could have then go directly to a video and they can maybe hear the audio or watch the video or watch a supplemental video. So we can make any text, any printed work interactive. So how do we do that? Well, it's really easy. One, of course, you can put links if it's a PDF, but if it's a paper version or also a PDF version, you could use QR stuff or many QR generators. And all you have to do is put your QR code, and I'm sorry, put your URL code where you are, oh, sorry, where you want to direct the viewer to, and then they'll take them from your printed work to that place. You can easily create a QR code in just a couple seconds. And again, like everything else here, it's free. So um, this makes it, multi you can also make your paper multifunctional. So here is an example of a PDF that we did before. And this is using yet again, another free tool. This is Kami. So when I first started this project, it was geared towards areas of, of you know, limited resources. And I was going to target Southeast Asia because the first area that I taught was in Southeast Asia. So I know the situation for a lot of the schools, especially rural schools that are resource strapped. Um, and so the idea was to make paper-based um, content that students could access via a phone using the QR code. Uh, because, you know, even everywhere in the world, the, the, the mobile phone penetration keeps getting higher and higher. But then COVID hit. And so suddenly this model also works for anywhere, for any situation in the world, because if, if students have books, it's kind of hard to do books in a Zoom lesson at home. But if you have like this PDF model, you can use a tool like Kami, and a teacher can use a tool like Kami, and it can be interactive. You can do text, you can draw, you can highlight, there's a lot of things you can do. So you can actually make any simple creation. Here's the activity that I made in Google Slides. You can make it interactive by using it in Kami. Okay, so then finally, once you have your book, if you wanna publish it, I publish all my books on issue. It's kind of like the YouTube for uh, textbooks, or the YouTube, I'm sorry, for PDFs. There's a lot of really nice magazines on there. It's a great resource for self-publishers, and it gives you this really great looking player that you can flip through the books. So if you want to display your work, I highly mention, I highly recommend, I'm sorry, issue. Okay, so then promote and present. This one's pretty easy. So in the past, you know, uh, these publishing companies would need a lot of marketers, right? They'd have their sales team. These days, we just have social media. Pinterest is really good for creating your own uh, books and promoting it. But of course, there's Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and everything's out there. Okay, so then the future of textbooks. So here it is. This is my last bit, and then I'll finish up here. Um, so I'm a kid from the 80s. 
So if you're a kid from the 70s or 80s or 90s, you might remember all of this, and it's all gone bye-bye. And, you know, think about a show like Friends. So when I, in the 90s, like the TV show Friends was really popular. And at that time, network TV dominated uh, pretty much, you know, media shows like that. Like you had to have a major TV studio produce a show like Friends. Um, these days, the, those same TV stations are struggling because of things like YouTube. Uh, the, the record companies now uh, cannot do as well as they could before because of things like SoundCloud. Um, you know, video is so popular on, on, on YouTube. So the same transformation that happened for media in terms of audio and video, I think is going to come to the publishing industry, especially in the textbook format. So what I see in the future is basically textbooks will be like Netflix. It might take 5, 10, 20 years, but we're going to get there eventually. Um, and what will happen is the, the big companies will start just hiring to, to share the rights of people's work. And when you, you won't buy one book, you'll just have an account with Oxford or Cambridge. And when you log in, everything will be modular. You can choose what you want. And maybe they'll have a service where you can create an account and you can create your own tests or use their tests or you can register students or something like that. But the, the book model and also the current LMS model, I think is gonna go away. And in the future, you're gonna see something similar to Netflix with independent creators, just because it's, I think, inevitable, really. You know, 12 years, uh, I'm sorry, eight years ago in 2012, I did a presentation on Google Docs. And everybody at my university was like, whoa, Google Docs. Now everybody uses Google Docs. Five years ago, I did a presentation on Quizlet. And everybody was like, wow, Quizlet or Google Forms. Wow. Now everybody does Google Forms and, and Quizlet. So I think we're moving in this direction, especially when you look at young people, the younger generation, the TikTok generation, they like user-generated content. They're not going to want to use big, bulky published materials. So in the future, I kind of see that we're going to have publishing. It's going to be a lot like Netflix. And you'll buy a, you'll pay for a subscription, and you'll have access to lots of different works. Uh, and that's it. So the Q and A is at the end. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, if you would like to email me, if you would like to make a book, I would be happy to help you make a book. <laughs> Your students make a book. It's very easy. Um, and you can see examples of my free books at lo.org and soundgrammar.com. And if you go to meals.org, that's a teacher training site that I have. There is a free course that you can sign up to and we show you how to do all this stuff step-by-step -step with tutorials. And that's it. I